All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. It looks like we have a majority of the people that wanna be here, here, except that person in the back who's coming in. You didn't miss anything? No, you're good, you're good. Come back. Welcome to my talk, Using Minikube Kubernetes for Node.js Development. Um, a little about who I am. My name is Troy Connor. I'm a software engineer at Emerging Technology Advisors. We usually just say ETA because it's really long. Um, what I do, I tinker with robots and JavaScript. There's been a lot of IoT stuff, so that, I've been at all, of, all of those talks. I help maintain an NPM module called N for node version management. So eight, I think something came out today, 8.1 or something. Um, and I'm a US Navy veteran. And that's how you get a hold of me on the internet. Troy0820 and all things. All right, we have a pro productivity problem. Um, I know where anybody works, you actually are told to push out apps faster, right? How do you push out apps faster? You can only develop at a certain pace and your whatever tooling you're using only gets it out there as fast as it can. And I'm not talking about from a perspective of you just need to code faster. You know, you can buy a keyboard that might help you, but actually getting the app to users is the problem that we face now. It's not the tooling we're using. So how do we change that? Um, for me, I used to come up with a whole bunch of excuses so I wouldn't have to deal with that. And here are some of the excuses. You know, like my, compo my code is compiling. I don't know if anybody ever used that one. Um, th that's a feature, I love that one. But my favorite one that I used to always use, I can't use it now because what I'm gonna show you with the gates all that, is it works on my machine. And we didn't know what the problem was because if it worked on my machine, it has to be DevOps fault, wouldn't it be, right? But um, there's only one problem. We're not shipping my machine. And I'm glad because I get to keep it. But um, something that fixed that, that's Docker. And that's like the underlying thing what helps containerize applications. So during a lot of these things, talks you've been to, to today, you've been hearing containerizing, you know, pushing stuff up into deployments and things like that. This helps the, it works on my machine perspective. So you can't use that excuse no more. And you know, this is what my workflow used to look like. I used to just make the app and then leave it alone, and then get paid. And it's, it's DevOps problem now, it's not mine, I don't know. But then Docker came out and that was supposed to solve the problem, right? Or solve the problem. <laughs> but now there's a new problem, your workflow changed and you have to adopt to how you can actually help DevOps and you collaborate. And if you don't have a DevOps team, that person might be you. And if you do, you don't wanna see them on a Friday when you push to production, do you? So you build your app, you run your local integration tests, and then your, your DevOps team will kind of use a tool like Jenkins to build it and you know, push to your Docker image and then you know, do all that automatically. But did we solve our problem? Because it sounds like there's more steps in those things. The first page just had like, I just build the app and that was it. Now there's, a, there's four bullets now. But so how do we control it? We control our containerization projects with um, open source thing called Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling, and managing containerized applications. So now we have this tool that's gonna actually help us restart containers when they fail or give us the status of what's going on with our applications. But there's one problem. If you're trying to set up this in production on like say for instance a cloud service that is listed at the bottom, it's not really easy. You know, so this is the problem that a lot of people face coming into Kubernetes. They're like, if I can do this with Docker, I'm fine there. But if getting to Kubernetes, I don't want to do anything else setting up that's more than pushing a button because I'm going to blame it on DevOps. And that's the, the goal of this talk, right? So <laughs> but, um, you know, I use Docker locally. So, like, I learned how to, like, make images. So, like, DevOps kind of gave me that part of my responsibility now. And... But how do I work with Kubernetes locally? And should that even be my responsibility? And if, it's, if you want to help DevOps, and you know, because they're going to keep passing stuff down, so it seems like the more I talk about this, the less DevOps has to do, right? And <laughs> so so um, you might work yourself in a job or work them out of a job, but um, we'll get to that later. So how do I do this locally? Let's, let's just wait for it. Of course you can use this locally. That's why we're here. We're here to discuss Minikube and how we're gonna work the magic that DevOps will not be needed in your company anymore. So what is Minikube? 
Minikube is, a, is Kubernetes on a single node cluster. So you pretty much have a VM on your laptop. You're using all sorts of drivers. VirtualBox is the one I'm using. There's XHive, there's KVM. And it makes a single node cluster, and you have all the tooling of Kubernetes that would be in the cloud on your laptop. So if you were actually going to use this as a use case to say, hey, company, please pay me money. Please pay for my provision environment so I can use Kubernetes to make our application better. They're going to say, no, just look at Troy's talk and use Minikube. <laughs> so this is what you're actually going to need to run Minikube. Like if you're going to need kubectl, I call it, um, yeah, I call it kubectl. It's kubectl. You can get that there. Um, for a Mac, I'm using a Mac. You, you can either use those three drivers that I named earlier, and for Linux and Windows, it's, it's the same. And you're going to need an internet connection on the first run because once you do Minikube start, which I won't demonstrate because we have Wi-Fi, I don't want that to be a problem. Um, it actually has to download the, bind, the, the ISO image and actually put that on your VM that you just provisioned. So here's how to install it. That's actually the easiest way. I'm not telling you to go buy a MacBook, but um, those three words will get you up and started. And um, here's how you get for Linux and for Windows as well. So like I said, what, what Minikube is going to do is actually going to act like your Kubernetes cluster in the cloud, but there's certain things that it can't do. Um, when, you, when you use your Kubernetes in the cloud, you actually have a expose where you can expose your application on a certain port. And if you use type load balancer, it's actually going to give you an IP address and put it right there. So it's going to be public facing. It, everything's a win. You can't do that because your laptop's not a cloud provider unless you're not telling me something. Um, so you have to expose it with no port. And it's not going to convince your, your boss that you need a raise because of your new DevOps skills. And um, what you can also do with Minikube is use the Docker version that's upgraded on your laptop, like the server version. So right now, Docker offers, I think, like 17, 6, we're in June, right? So 6. And, um, but if you do this with Minikube, you're going to get like version 1.11. So I mentioned that because there's a lot of things missing from like 1.11 through version 17.06 that you are used to maybe using that you're not going to be able to do, but the functionality still exists. It's just how we go about doing it, which is great because now that you can bring this anywhere, it's going to say, hey, if I use Kubernetes in GKE, for example, I, I know what I can do to make it work, or if I use it in AWS, for example, or you know, any other cloud platform that allows you to use Kubernetes. So people ask me, how is this any different from um, like Docker Compose? Because Docker Compose is something that locally will run for your dev environment to be spun up so you can actually utilize. I don't need the other person who wrote the, the microservice that I need because if I have Docker, if I have Cooper, Docker Compose, excuse me, I can just spin that up and everything's working. But if you want to get to the point where you can actually do this in production and like do blue-green deployments, you're not going to Docker Compose on a cluster or try to you want to use real commands that Kubernetes allows you to do to actually start doing some of the stuff that I'm going to demonstrate. So the project I'm working with is called Fix California. And I know it sounds like I'm complaining, but I'm not. It's basically this, all this app does is it hits this API for C Click Fix It, and it brings back all this data that says these are the problems that, we, that have been reported through this API. And it just puts them nice, pretty on the map. So I felt it would be more interesting to do it here in California since we're here than back home in Hampton, Virginia, because y'all don't know where that is. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you is that I have, a, I have my Docker images that, I actually, that are on my Minikube virtual machine, and I'm going to deploy those into a, onto my cluster. I'm going to make replica sets. I'm going to show health checks, um, auto-scaling, the dashboard, the Minikube services. I'm going to show you how you can use ingress to expose multiple applications with, um, with using one load balancer. So the problem with before is that you have a whole bunch of microservices, and you don't want to keep provisioning a whole bunch of, exposing them on a whole bunch of load balancers, because now your Google bill or whatever you're using is tremendous, and you probably will not be on the DevOps team anymore. You'll probably be back working with Minikube until you figure it out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so now you can put stuff behind like certain application. So oh, you have one load balancer, but then you can actually use that ingress controller to actually use different endpoints for the services. So this is what I did before you guys got here and before I got on the plane to get here. Um, I used Minikube version 18. I did Minikube start. That's actually going to provision the cluster that I needed. But if I stop it and start it, it's the same cluster, so I don't lose any of the data. 
um, Minikube Docker Env is going to give me the Minikube Docker environment so I can interact with the virtual machine that's hosting all the images. Uh, when I evaluate the Minikube Docker Env, that is actually going to let me use that environment and API or whatever. And I already did all the images that I needed to download. So I'll show you what I'm talking about. So is this too small? Can you guys see this? A little bigger. A little bigger? Or is that thumbs up for bigger or thumbs up for cool? Good. Okay. Did you say a little bigger? Uh, okay, well, well, I'll show you later. <laughs> so if I do Docker images, this is not on my local machine. This is actually on the, the Minikube virtual machine. So those last GCR.IOs, that's actually what makes Kubernetes run. Those are the containers that are actually make the replica sets and listen for, and for pods to destroy and everything like that. If I'm going too fast, just let me know. I'll slow down. I'll try to explain more just anytime you have a question. So if you notice, there's Troy 0820, Fix Cali version 1, 2, and version 3. And then there's an Nginx proxy. So what I'm going to demonstrate now is how I would actually run. OK, I saw people. I oh, I'll do it again. So what I'm going to demonstrate now is how I would like to see, like, deploy this application to my Minikube cluster. So I aliased, let me see, let me show you. I aliased Cube Cuddle, the thing I told you that you needed to download, to KB, because I really don't like typing that, fat, that much. And typing in front of y'all and misspelling words is not a good thing. So I'm going to do cube, cube, KB run. I'm going to call this fix it. And I'm going to press up because I did this already. And if you look at the last part where it says image pull policy, if not present, if it's going to look first locally, and if it's not there, it's going to try to pull from Docker Hub or, or Google um, Container Registry. But the reason we, we're, the whole point of this is that you're going to make these Docker images and try to use what you have to start putting on these cluster or whatever. So I'm going to use version one, and version one, there it is, deployment created. That's not the party trick, so just keep, so just hang on. So if I, if I look, it's going to show that I started make, I made a pod. And a pod is actually a collection of containers that are in the same namespace that, I, that, that are going to interact with each other. So what I'm going to show you now is that I'm going to actually put an Nginx container in front of it and expose that so you can use the, the Nginx container to get to the application. So I'm not exposing the one I just, because if I try to get there, I can't, I can't get to the application. So I actually have to expose this as a cluster IP. It all makes sense in a minute, I, I promise. OK, so now I know I didn't say anything while I was typing, because if I would have talked, I would have spelled something wrong. But what, <laughs> what I did was I, I made an Nginx container, and I have the Fix It app. And the, what I'm trying to demonstrate by putting this, low, by putting this Nginx thing here is that Q, Kubernetes has DNS. So it doesn't really need to know the IP of what I just deployed. As long as you say, point it to the Fix It app, and that's the name of the service, it's going to automatically hook up to each other. So then. Like I said, see that service at the bottom that says nginx 80.3, well, colon, 310601? That's actually how I'm going to get to the application. So if I do minikube service, not fix it because that's not, that's not exposed to anything. But if I do minikube service nginx, it should bring up my local browser. And it should say, come on, internet. Don't fail me now. There it is. So that's the application. So at the bottom, there's a lot, of, a lot of things. And there's some issues that we won't tell Santa Clara about until after we leave. So that's the first version of this app. That's v1, right? So if I wanted to like change v1 to v2, I don't have to shut down this version of the app. I can actually just edit the deployment and watch it just automatically hook, um, be, be fixed. So if I do edit, deployment, fix it, and it's going to open up my Vim editor. Can you guys see that? OK. 
I'm going to scroll down because I don't want to mess this up. And I'm going to use version two. And then it says deployment edited. So if you look right now, hopefully I'm fast enough, it's going to start terminating some of the, the pods. Well, I only had one pod. So it's going to terminate one, and it's actually going to create another one. So the reason why, so now it's terminating, right? And if I do get pods, there should be a new one up there. So the one that used to be up there, the WVX9L, gone. The new pod is up there, and it just transitioned the state to this app, this version, which has zip codes. So now you know the zip codes that are up there. So that was the little, oh, I didn't know what to do. I, I put the zip codes up there. They want to see what's wrong in certain zip codes. So now the zip codes of this thing is on this app, on this version. So uh, what would happen is that like now more people in Santa Clara are getting kind of understanding what's going on. So they want to scale the actual, because I don't know if, if you guys were here for earlier talks, you saw that we scale, scale horizontally. So, and then, so we want to scale, get this five replicas. So if I scale this deployment, it's actually going to start making more pods. And it's just going to start working. So once those get created, now you have five replicas of the app that I just deployed earlier. And what, where, where this is going to help you is that when you start receiving a lot of traffic, and that's why I put the load balancer in front of it, because now it just starts getting, it doesn't matter which, where it goes, it's going to route it to the instance that doesn't have anything on it. So where we can see this is something that I'm going to show you called Minikube Dashboard. And this is an add-on that's automatically hooked up when you start Minikube Start. So the dashboard is going to show you everything you want to know about your deployments and your it looks real pretty. You can actually do stuff from here. I'm not going to do that because, but um, here you go. Here's your pods. You have five of them. And if you look at the logs, you see where the memory and the bytes, some of them haven't even been touched. So you can actually view the logs of the container, and it says, oh, okay, cool. We did the node app.js, and we went to one page, and we went to the next page. And that's what happens. So if I keep, I don't want to do the curl because I'm actually, it feels like I'm running out of time. But I'm going to demonstrate the next part where the health checks and the auto scaling could come in. All right, so I'm going to clear this out. I'm going to delete the two deployments so I can start from scratch where I'm going to demonstrate the next thing. I'm going to delete deployment, fix it, and Nginx. And it's deleted. But it, what it, when it deletes the deployment, it also deletes the replica set. So it's not going to recreate it again. If I was just to delete the pods, it would actually start up all over again. So if I delete the service, OK, so I don't have anything now. So now I'm going to use a different command called KB create. And this is actually going to, well, let me let you see it first, because that actually help you understand what I'm doing. So this is a deployment that I was actually running the whole time before. But this one's different, because now I have this liveliness probe and readiness probe. And what this defines to the, on the deployment is that when you launch this, it's going to use, it's going to keep hitting that endpoint slash health to see if your pod is ready. And if it's, if it's there, it's going to say, oh, okay, it's good. It's going to keep doing that over and over and over again. But once it fails, it's going to say, uh, we need to relaunch another one. So I do this because you can actually define the HTTP endpoints. You can do TCP ones and for, for, for your application as well. So my Vim skills. So I'm going to create this. OK. So now I created that. And I still got to expose that to the cluster port. And I'm also going to put, I'm going to do the thing with the Nginx. should have two pods running. OK, so expose engine X. But this time, instead of um, doing no port on the engine X, I'm going to do cluster IP. So now I can't access these at all. But why I'm doing that is because when I use the ingress controller that engine X has bundled with Minikube, you're going to be able to put these endpoints at certain things. So then when I go to like, the Minikube um, IP slash Nginx, it'll route back to wherever. So right here, you see the services. There's no colon on any of those things. 
So what I have to do to create that, I have to create this ingress, inst um, ingress resource. And the ingress resource is something simple. It looks like this. All it is is telling on path nginx, I want the service name nginx. On path slash fix it, I want the, the um, service slash fix it. Well, if you remember, this nginx is sitting in front of fix it. So I actually don't really need the fix it, the slash fix it. I'm just showing you that when you use cluster IP, you can put that there and then you can hit, use your ingress controller to put however many services behind it. So um, let me demonstrate that if I create it first. All right, so if I get my ingress, it's not ready yet, and it should give me an address soon. And once it gives me the address, it's gonna be available. To... All right, cool. So now I'm gonna to go to this slash nginx. And it works. That was the party trick. So, but, uh, so, 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 so basically, um, now it, it's not secure because it's not the SSL is not terminated with the Nginx controller, and that's another tutorial for another day. But basically, what that means is that you can put as many microservices behind this Ingress controller and just give them an endpoint. So then they're all in the same namespace. So your Kubernetes cluster, your your Node app can to see everything that's in there. So it's, it's actually going to help you develop a lot faster because once you start putting things behind each other and stuff like that, you have all the resources you need. Instead of like spinning up a Docker container that's gonna crash and then you say, oh, I don't know how to replace it or it's not on restart or anything like that. So what I do wanna show is that um, it's Grafana. It's an add-on that's actually used with Heapster. So it actually gives you all the data that you want from your cluster. So you can actually go here after you launch it and then you see everything about it. And one thing I am gonna show, but I can't really demonstrate too well because of the fact that I can't get it to ping over 50% computer usage, is auto scale. So if you wanna auto scale your deployment, you would do auto scale, deployment fix it, minimum three, or let's say minimum two, max five. So if you get your HPA, that's your horizontal pod auto scaler. It will say, okay, I always need two pods. But once it starts going above 50%, give me five. And then it can just do that, your horizontal in and out for you. So you don't have to worry about it. Then you can go home, and then you can blame DevOps, and then you can try to get that raise you wanted. <laughs> so um, that's, it. that's all for my talk. If anybody had any questions, I'm, I'm here for you. Questions? Oh, Michael. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, like all the commands you showed us is running locally in Minikube, are they the same commands that you would use when you deploy to the- Same exact uh, commands. Okay, so that's the- That's the, that's the beauty of it, because right. like now this translates over to your skills that you're gonna try to get that raise for. Right. And then you don't have to learn anything new. Like a lot of times what happens is that um, when you're trying to like provision environments, you have to learn like a new command line thing. And then like, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. So. This, you don't have to be afraid of this because if you're developing locally, trying to figure out how to, the best way to architect, because you, what, you, what I pretty much just did is I just architected arch, that word. Right. I just did that here. Right. So like um, I can to, to figure out, hey, what do I need to do with this endpoint? Or how do I gonna get these services to talk to each other instead of using something else? If I want to use like an uh, endpoint where I want to use serverless technology, I can do that here before we even think about deploying it. So it's gonna save you money, which make, should make your company pay you more because now you have these new skills and stuff. Okay, thanks. No problem. Yes. Uh, it, it's a great talk. Um, I'm wondering what is the connection between Cloud Foundry, since we're at the Cloud Foundry Summit with uh, Minikube? Oh yeah, well, um, being the Node.js track, I was trying to sh show how we can, because you can actually deploy Kubernetes on Cloud Foundry. And um, these are one of the things that they were actually discussing just before the talk, how this was a, a, comp a competitor type of thing. I, I don't know the words to use that you were saying, but I'll, I'll let you, I don't want to speak for you, and I know that. Some um, have observed there's some overlap between yeah, the function and, of Kubernetes and the function of Cloud Foundry, and people right. are figuring out what that means. Yeah, and, and, and it's good for, because um, that's the same thing is happening with like Docker Swarm mode and, and Kubernetes. So being that the, the functionality is 
um, overlap th these technologies, it's good for the community because we can all learn from something. So like if, there, if we're not implementing something here or if we're implementing something different in Cloud Foundry or even putting Kubernetes in Cloud Foundry, we can all learn from the, how we can deploy developments faster. Because I mean, that's the basis for what we're here for. Node.js originally was used to build microservices fast. You can, the last talk was here, you know, the, he said, that's what we do. We build stuff fast and iteratively. So you can use this to build your stuff iteratively faster and even use Cloud Foundry as a platform to try to uh, make this all work for you. Rob. The, all these scripts and code that you showed, will it be available on the GitHub? What software? I'm going to do, because I didn't do that, and I realized okay. I was like, what I, um, what I end up showing, because the, the GitHub repo is there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the readme in the GitHub repo. I'll even make an issue for me to do it, and then I'll just list everything that I did. So that way, um, if you want to try this at home, you can just pull it down and then just start deploying stuff. No problem. Any other questions for Troy? Okay, thanks very much, Troy. Thank you.